three, two, one. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Water Research Foundation webcast. We're having some technical difficulties here. <laughs> uh, the webcast title is Unintended Consequences of Implementing Nitrous and Control Strategies. Uh, we have uh, a lot of information to share with you, but before I get into the technical, I'm going to have to go through some housekeeping items. Uh, you have uh, the possibility of asking questions uh, at the end of the webcast. Please sub submit. You can submit them through the the question box at the bottom of the of your screen. Uh, we will have uh, a Q and A at the end of the of the webcast, so you'll have the opportunity to ask. Don't forget that at the end of the webcast, there will be a survey, and then uh, please, uh, we encourage you to uh, to fill the survey. Uh, that will uh, help us improve and uh, respond to your needs. Um, I just want to let you know that the slides and the recording of the webcast will be available at uh, the Water Research Foundation webcast waterrf.org, and if you have any question about PDH, you can contact Michel Suazo at uh, the email address and suazo at waterrf.org. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the next slide uh, is basically showing you where you can enter your uh, Q&A questions at the bottom right of the screen. And then uh, the next one will be just uh, uh, how to download the presentations. Okay, uh, this project is uh, one of the projects that the foundation has funded through uh, what we call a focus area. In 2012, the foundation decided to develop a multi-year research agenda focusing on NDMA and other nitrosamine too. Uh, the objective, quickly, as you see here, it's uh, threefold. One is to identify the contribution of the source water quality, the treatment processes, uh, and the distribution system to the total pool of nitrosamine. Uh, the second objective is to develop control strategies to minimize, um, prevent, or at least minimize the formation of these uh, nitrosamines. And, and finally, it is uh, to identify unintended consequences and the cost of implementation of nitrosamine control strategies, uh, keeping in mind always that uh, we have to keep in mind the risk-risk trade-off. As, uh, as you know, uh, uh, dealing with DDPs is a balancing act. So uh, basically, uh, formation of regulated versus non-regulated, and that's about. For me, uh, the next thing is basically we're going to delve into the project, into the, the webcast. Uh, the, the, I, I really have to apologize because I'm having technical difficulties, and I hope that you are uh, able to uh, to follow me. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's a little bit difficult too. So the topic, the focus area, and I. Uh, program is uh, we have developed during this year from 2012 to 2016-17. There were seven projects that were funded, and most of them are completed, and the reports are available uh, at the at our website. Uh, but today, mostly, we have uh, the focus on Project 4491, that is unintended consequences of uh, minimize uh, of um, the cost uh, control strategies, the implementation of control strategies of nitrosamine, but we'll be mentioning several projects because, as you know, uh, you know, uh, results from other uh, uh, studies will be also involved. 4492, the investigate 4452, investigating coagulant aid alternative poly uh, will be mentioning the the identify a source and. Uh, 
a fate of polymer derived uh, nitrosamine uh, precursors, but also the project that is almost complete now, which is published soon biological treatment. Uh, is it NDMA control or a source of NDMA precursors? And now I'm really going through uh, the webcast. We have three outstanding speakers today, and uh, uh, I'm not going to read the biographies. All the biographies are available on our website. We have Caroline, Caroline Russell from Corolla Engineer, Richard, Richard Brown from Cornwell Engineering, and Ashley Evans from uh, Arcadis Engineering, and there are many, many more players uh, in this webcast. So with no further ado, I'm going to let Caroline lead you through unintended consequences of implementing nitrosamine control strategy. Caroline? Thanks, Jeanette. So as Jeanette mentioned, um, three of us are going to be presenting results from the project today, um, myself, Ashley Evans, and Richard Brown, but I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge other members of the research team, David Cornwell um, of Cornwall Engineering, David Reckow of UMass Amherst, and Tanji Karenfell of Clemson University were all co-PIs on this project. Mahmoud Ersan, who's now a postdoc at SNWA, um, was, did some of the oxidation uh, tests that Ashley's going to talk about while he was at Clemson. Um, and Steve Bai is not listed, but he was a technical advisor on the project. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge the utility participants. Um, this project could not have been conducted without the support of the uh, water utilities that participated in the project, um, and we're very thankful for their involvement. Nitrosamines are uh, organic nitrogen compounds that are potential carcinogens at low nanogram per liter concentrations. Um, at least nine nitrosamines have been identified. The six shown in this table are the six that were included on the um, second unregulated, unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. Um, this slide shows a summary of UCMR2 occurrence data for the six nitrosamines. Um, all large water systems were required under UCMR2 to sample at all their entry points to the distribution system and all of the corresponding maximum residence time distribution system locations for those six nitrosamines, and a subset of small systems had to sample. And the main thing to point out from the data are for most of the nitrosamines, five of the six, um, less than 2% of systems had uh, detectable concentrations of those uh, nitrosamines in their finished water distribution system samples. Um, and really the only nitrosamine that showed up with a significant degree of occurrence under UCMR2 was in nitrosodimethylamine, um, which showed up in at least one sample for one out of every four water systems that participated in UCMR2. So the remainder of this presentation is really going to focus in on NDMA. NDMA was first uh, uh, discovered in drinking water in 1989 in Ontario, Canada. Um, there are a number of different sources of potential sources of NDMA in drinking water. Um, there's some uh, plumes of NDMA contamination uh, from liquid, liquid rocket fuel production, so it can occur as a source water contaminant. In the water treatment plant, um, research has shown that ion exchange resins can leach um, NDMA as well as other nitrosamines. Um, in the water treatment plant, the, the primary formation mechanism for NDMA in drinking water is from reaction of precursors with chloramines. And Schreiber and Mitch in a publication um, in 2006 postulated that dichloramine in particular was important for reaction of um, precursors to form NDMA. Those precursors can be watershed derived from agricultural discharges or wastewater discharges. Um, they also can be uh, polymer derived. Uh, in particular, polydabmac and polyamine, uh, cationic amine based polymers have been found to be to react with chloramines to form NDMA. You can also get uh, continued formation of NDMA in the distribution system. And there have been a few sources of um, NDMA contamination identified in the distribution system, a paper from Australia showing some uh, um, rubber components leaching NDMA, and as well as a study in the U.S. indicating a gasket in a storage tank could leach NDMA. 
Research has shown uh, that a number of different uh, control strategies could be applied to remove precursors prior to chloramine uh, addition to reduce formation in uh, drinking water. Um, and the main thing to point out from this uh, graphic, we'll talk about the different control strate uh, strategies as we move through the, the webcast, but for each one of the ones shown, um, whether source water treatment, using riverbank filtration, um, different oxidation uh, strategies, polymer optimization, and so on, a range of treatment uh, performance has been uh, indicated in the literature. So the graph shows the percent precursor removal, the range that's been reported in different articles that are cited at the bottom of the slide. And what this highlights is, is the, um, that depending on the testing conditions, you could see a range of performance. And for a given utility, it's going to be critical to test those control strategies under site-specific conditions to understand the percent precursor removal that could be achieved um, for a given control strategy at, at that location. NDMA, there's currently no federal regulation. Um, California has established notification levels of 10 nanogram per liter for NDMA and two other nitrosamines. Um, US EPA has taken a number of steps through the years to um, uh, uh, indicating their consideration of regulating um, NDMA. Most recently, they, uh, in their third six-year review, they indicated that um, NDMA should be uh, considered along with any revisions to the stage uh, one and two disinfection byproduct rules, but there's currently no regulation. As Jeanette mentioned, the focus area that the foundation um, established is really to help prepare utilities for potential regulation, trying to understand um, control strategies, and for this project, really trying to understand um, specifically the simultaneous compliance, risk balancing, operational and cost implications of uh, implementing a control strategy uh, for NDMA at a water treatment plant. And then the other objective of this project was to translate those findings into clear guidelines for water systems that would either proactively try to reduce NDMA in their finished water or would need to do so in response to a potential future regulation. The um, project was actually conducted in two phases, which I think is somewhat unique uh, or, or rare for water research foundation projects. The first phase was a qualitative um, assessment of the unintended consequences of implementing control strategies, and it was uh, comprised of three main components. We conducted a literature review to tabulate documented consequences of these different control strategies that were um, highlighted in one of the previous slides. Um, a major emphasis of the um, phase one study was to conduct a desktop evaluation of 14 utilities where we solicited utility in input on what the implications might be to them if they had to do something to control NDMA. And we uh, coupled that with a workshop where we further solicited input from the utility participants and we sought um, their uh, input as well on what sort of guidance may be useful um, from this project to help utilities understand how to walk through the steps to identify control strategies, taking into account unintended consequences. The second phase was really focusing on trying to get some quantitative information, and we did full-scale sampling, um, bench and pilot testing of different control strategies and evaluated costs, um, all focused on being able to quantify some of the, um, the simultaneous compliance and operational um, considerations associated with those control strategies. So I'm going to start by focusing in on some of the key findings from phase one of the research. Some articles have been published um, directly uh, um, discussing some of the trade-offs um, in disinfection byproduct formation from implementing NDMA control strategies. Uh, the one shown, the s &T article by Misha Shaw and all um, provide some of that data. The graph at the bottom of the slide is taken from an uh, article published in the Journal of the American Water Works Association um, by Stuart 
Krasner um, in 2012. And the main thing to point out from the graph, if you look just at the cluster of bars where it says ozone effluent, in the tests that they conducted, they saw that in the, the beige bar, it's on the, the right-hand side of that cluster, um, they could get about 60% uh, degradation of NDMA precursors using ozonation. But um, that correlated to a 300% increase of chloropicrin uh, formation. And so that highlights the risk balancing that uh, Jeanette was alluding to from implementing um, that particular NDMA control strategy. We also, in the lit review, um, uh, surveyed some of the existing documents that talk about simultane simultaneous compliance for different control strategies that could be implemented for NDMA, but were not necessarily, the, the reports themselves were not focused on implementing those strategies for NDMA. Um, and a classic example is the simultaneous compliance guidance manual for the long-term two and stage two DVP roles. So we tabulated information from all of those documents to understand and begin to collate in one place the simultaneous compliance, risk trade-offs, and operational considerations associated with NDMA control. Um, a, a key factor in the phase one study, as I mentioned, was soliciting input from our 14 participating water utilities on what it might mean to them to implement an NDMA control strategy. And we, um, it, when we asked utilities to participate in this project, we uh, specifically tried to engage utilities that covered a broad range of source water and treatment characteristics. Um, uh, that are shown here. In addition to the, the factors shown in this slide, we also um, identified utilities that were both small and large. Um, so the 14 water utilities capture a range of utility size and also geographic distribution. Um, to solicit their input on consequences of implementing NDMA control strategies, we walked through the process shown here. We first collected utility data to understand um, characteristics of their treatment plan, identify potential sources of NDMA, and based on that, what, what control strategies may be applicable for them. And then based on that information, we got on a one to two hour conference call and walked through the control strategies they may implement and specifically asked them, what would it mean to you if you had to do X, Y, or Z to address NDMA? One of the first things we found in, um, in going through this exercise was that UCMR2 data alone are insufficient to assess the sources of NDMA at a given water treatment plant. This figure shows NDMA concentrations um, measured at different sampling events for one of the participating utilities. And um, there are a couple things to highlight. For UCMR2 data for this utility, they indicated that the, um, the utility probably wouldn't have any compliance issues if EPA regulated at 10 nanogram per liter, for example. But further graph sampling that the utility conducted, in part for a Water Research Foundation project, illustrated that um, higher NDMA concentrations could occur at that plant, um, illustrating some year-to-year -year variability. Um, the other thing for UCMR2, it, it, um, while it provided uh, important occurrence data to understand how frequently NDMA was detected in um, what, uh, drinking water and at what concentrations, it doesn't really tell us much about the source of NDMA. You, you can see what the finished water and distribution system concentrations are, but you don't know if, if the NDMA is coming from a source contaminant, if it's um, derived from watershed precursors or polymer um, precursors. And so it was uh, quickly clear that more data would be needed to identify NDMA sources. Um, what we did, um, this graph table is a little busy, but basically for some of the utilities, the ones that are shown with the superscript A, there were enough data from other Water Research Foundation projects to really kind of hone in on where NDMA was coming from at those plants. Um, for example, utility M treats both groundwater and surface water and some of the groundwater supplies had measurable concentrations of NDMA above, uh, well above 10 nanogram per liter. Um, and the data they had helped us understand that um, NDMA was a source water contaminant for that utility. 
Um, but for utilities that didn't participate in other studies, either on their own or through WRF, we had to um, identify likely sources of NDMA through uh, just an analysis of plant characteristics. For example, if they uh, reported um, agricultural in, um, impacts to their source water, uh, then watershed-derived precursors were identified as possible sources of NDMA. But the main thing to get from this table is that the first, one of the first things a utility would need to do to respond to an NDMA regulation or um, to proactively try to reduce NDMA concentrations would be to conduct profiling, um, seasonally, uh, uh, seasonal sampling to confirm sources and relative contribution. The next step we took um, in trying to gather utility input on consequences of NDMA control strategies was to propose what control strategies they may implement based on plant-specific data. And again, some utilities had already gone through some of the effort themselves, and uh, we knew uh, what control strategies may still be um, helpful to them to reduce their NDMA concentrations um, in their finished water and distribution system. But others, um, for example, Utility E had already taken multiple steps and including polymer optimization to reduce NDMA concentrations in their finished water. Their NDMA concentrations were consistently below 10, but they had uh, NDMA in the distribution system. So distribution system control and management was identified as a control strategy. For others, we proposed um, strategies based on what we understood uh, about the plant. Um, for example, if they used a polydadmac or polyamine precursor, or uh, polyamine, um, Polymer, we identify polymer optimization as a potential strategy to reduce NDMA. If they already used PAC, we um, identified uh, optimization of carbon type and dose as a strategy they may um, fairly easily implement to reduce NDMA. If their THM and HA5 concentrations were well within the um, compliance limits for stage one and two, uh, DVP rules, we uh, identified additional chlorine oxidation as something that may help them reduce um, NDMA. Um, so I'm going to talk through um, uh, some how we use this information specifically for utility H as an example and um, to then have a discussion around the site-specific considerations. So for each utility, we developed a table like the one shown here. Um, the first four columns were the same for all utility. All utilities, um, they show the different compliance strategies and their effectiveness on different sources of NDMA. Um, for each utility, we highlighted in bold the control strategies that may be applicable for them. And then we got on a call and we talked to them about what, would it, what the site-specific considerations might be for the different control strategies. So for utility H, a couple things to highlight. They had, have multiple chlorine feed points and historically low trihalomethane and haloacetic acid concentrations. So increased chlorine oxidation was identified as a potential control strategies. strategy. One thing they highlighted was that they currently meet the 40-30 role for THM and HA5 in terms of the frequency of uh, DVP monitoring. So if they increase their free chlorine oxidation time, they may not meet that goal anymore. The, some of the conversations alluded to potential benefits of control strategies. For example, for this plant, oxidation with ozone, um, the utility identified that they could have some benefits in terms of taste and odor control. They um, add chloramines before uh, polymer, or before sedimentation at, at the, um, this utility's plant. And Richard's going to talk more about the impact of the chlorine and ammonia addition point on um, the reaction of polymers to form NDMA. Um, so that was identified as potential control strategy for them to optimize their um, how they feed polymer, polymer relative to where they feed chloramines. Um, one thing they indicated as a site-specific consideration associated with optimizing, uh, per perhaps reducing their polymer dose, is if that was coupled with an increase in their ferric chloride dose, they could run into issues with achieving their um, finished water pH goals. They might need to do, they would need to add in some pH adjustment um, to the um, uh, tail end of the plant. So 
just to kind of wrap up um, the, these discussions with the utilities, a lot of the simultaneous compliance, risk balancing, and operational impacts of different control strategies, we tabulated based on engineering experience and the literature review. But in talking to the utilities, a number of um, concerns were highlighted that we didn't necessarily get from the literature. As an example, um, looking at a change in polymer dose or, um, or type, two of the utilities highlighted potential impacts of MPDS permits. Um, I, I permit limits um, if they increase their coagulant dose in response to a change in polymer um, I conditions. Uh, they highlighted with in conjunction with changing um, their use of polymer whether or not they could continue to meet the partnership for safe drinking water requirements. And that can be important in terms of cons customer confidence in, in drinking water supplies. It can also um, have some implications in terms of pathogen risk reduction while still meeting um, the enhanced surface water treatment rule requirements. The, one of the major outcomes from phase one was this development of a framework that basically steps through the approach I just talked about um, to evaluate nitrosamine control strategies and consequences for a given utility. Um, for each one of the steps shown, we <coughs> developed guidelines some sort of guidance documents um, I, I associated with that step. So for step one, we have a table indicate in the report indicating what sort of data should be collated as, as a utility steps through this process. We have guidelines on how to identify the locations and conduct source to tap profiling to understand the sources at a plant. We, um, up, we built on a, a decision tree that Stuart Krasner developed for a previous water research foundation project for a utility to kind of step through based on their NDMA sources and plant characteristics, what control strategies they may want to further evaluate. And we developed guidelines for step four to conduct bench tests to assess the control strategies, um, specifically accounting for um, understanding some of the consequences of implementing those strategies. So now I'm going to um, start talking more about phase two. Um, in phase two, what we did is we tested and further developed the guidelines um, that I just showed from phase one. And uh, one of the objectives was to capture quantitative information on consequences, including developing cost opinions for two utilities of implementing those control strategies and to mitigate unintended consequences. So for utility B and C, we did this for two utilities. We conducted four quarterly source to tap profiling events. We conducted two rounds of bench um, testing of the different control strategies shown in the table. Um, and we conducted two rounds so we could capture the performance of those control strategies and consequences under different seasonal events. So I'm going to talk about the source to tap profiling, and then um, Richard and Ashley are going to talk about some of the um, uh, control strategies that we tested. This slide shows a process schematic for utility B um, at their 80 MGD uh, water treatment plant. This is part of the information that we collect in step one of the framework. Um, and the uh, things to highlight from this figure, in the green stars indicate where we collected samples to send to Eurofin uh, an analytical labs for nitrosamine analysis using EPA method 521. The orange circles show where we collected samples and we sent them to Eurofin to then chloraminate under uniform formation conditions to quantify the chloramine reactive precursors at different sample locations at the plant. And we strategically um, identified the sampling locations. We wanted to understand NDMA concentrations in the source water to see if NDMA was a source contaminant. We also wanted to quantify precursors in the source water to see if um, Indian precursors were watershed derived. This plant uh, splits flowed through two different trains. Um, and the way they recycle their residuals is different for each train, so we wanted to quantify NDMA and NDMA precursors in the two different uh, combined influence uh, for the different trains. 
We sampled for NDMA um, precursors under UFC conditions in the settled water to quantify the additional contribution of, of polymer-derived precursors um, through the coagulation process. And we sampled the finished water and the distribution system for NDMA to assess the seasonal concentrations of NDMA and um, whether or not this plant would need to implement control strategy to, to meet different compliance targets. This graph shows the results from the profiling of preformed NDMA. So these aren't the precursors, it's the NDMA that's already in the different, uh, in the water at the different sample locations for the four quarterly sampling events. NDMA was the only nitrosamine detected, so that's the only one shown in the graph. Um, the quarterly sampling showed that NDMA is formed following chloramination. Chloramines are added after to the settled water, but at variable levels. And the concentrations for this utility at the entry plant and distribution system were lower than observed during UCMR2 sampling. The precursor data showed um, that on one of the quarterly sampling events, there were some precursors in the source water, so some watershed-derived precursors, but they were mostly non-detect. Um, the recycled water had no notable contribution to the combined plant influent for the two trains. Um, the higher settled water NDMA UFC concentrations reflect the contribution of the polymer-derived um, precursors in, through the coagulation process. So, in summary, from the source to tap profiling, um, what, it helped us illustrate seasonal variations and confirm the relative sources of nitrosamines and NDMA precursors at the utility. And it also helped to inform which control strategies may provide the most benefit. For example, for the utility that I showed, most of the time the precursors were from the polymers. And so raw water ozonation really wouldn't help them address those precursors, and it helped us understand that for that utility, settled water ozonation would be a more important control strategy for NDMA. So at this point, I'm going to pass it off to Richard to talk about some of the bench tests that were conducted on polymer optimization and pack addition. Okay. Thank you, uh, Carolyn. Uh, these are some um, results from uh, three different um, research foundation projects. Um, 4491, which is the focus of this particular webcast, but also some other um, projects that uh, I've worked on for 4452 and 4622. Um, 4452, the information uh, includes uh, a lot of other information not included in this presentation, but the part in this presentation includes some from us as well as uh, information contributed from Stuart Krasner and Sabina Arwile from MWD. And the 4622 project was, uh, Paul Westerhoff was the uh, PI and Natalia Fisher uh, from Arizona State did a lot of the work, including analyzing the NDMA samples. Um, the, we're gonna talk uh, mostly about polymers in a lot of the topics I'm gonna be talking about today. We're, the first part is uh, picking the right polymer uh, that can give you the coagulation, uh, particle removal that you want, and also picking the right dose so that you don't overdose. Uh, talk a little bit about chlorine, ammonia, application point in particular relative to where the polymer is added and where the polymer is removed during clarification. Uh, we're gonna talk about the consequences of that polymer addition um, when you're in a situation where the water happens to have more bromide uh, or there is an increase in bromide due to some uh, uh, discharge into your source water and what you can, how that impacts your uh, the NDMA formation from, uh, from your uh, polymers and also a little bit about powdered activated carbon impact on those precursors. In uh, project 4452, we looked at a diff bunch of different products to see how well they worked to produce the particle removal that we were looking for and yet what kind of uh, NDMA precursor material was present in those products. This graph on the vertical axis shows the NDMA yield, which is nanograms of NDMA per milligram of active polymer. So this is a, these are all doses as um, active product. And all, throughout this presentation, if I don't mention it again, all the doses are milligram per liter as active polymer. 
So what we have on this graph, the first six bars, the higher ones, are for polydadmac products and shows the yield of NDMA from those products versus three polyacrylamides, PAM, and to the right are a bunch of bars that aren't there because they're non-detected uh, for some natural polymers uh, from shellfish, like chitosan, from CS, cornstarch, PS, potato starch, or TP, tapioca root. And in these studies, we found that depending on what polymer you used, you could have more or less NDMA formation. Now, a polyacrylamide, you might not use for the same function as a polydadmac. The polyacrylamide is often used for coagulation or flocculation improvement or maybe as a filter aid, whereas polydadmac is used in a coagulation. The polyacrylamide is not as useful for the same purposes. It has a higher molecular weight and a lower charge density. But um, the natural polymers we tested all have um, the same function and perform as well or better as the polydadmac. Um, but what you can see here is there is a difference in the different products, but also for the polydadmac, what you can see is that depending on which polydadmac product you use, you can have more or less NDMA precursor potentially present in that polymer product. Now, that was in the previous graph was all uh, in DI water, so the chloramine was contacting the whole polymer. The, um, this chart shows the NDMA yield also on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis is, four, is five different P, uh, polydadmac products, and it shows a set of bars. The highest bars in the back, the blue, are for, also for DI water, where you're contacting the chloramine with the whole polymer. And the other two sets of bars in front of that are during jar tests where you coagulate and part of the polymer is removed during clarification and so less of the polymer remains afterwards to react with the chloramine. So this shows that there is a difference between how much precursor is present in the native polymer material, but if you can clarify and remove that polymer before you contact the chloramine, the NDMA formation is less. In other words, the NDA precursor that remains after clarification is less. So these two graphs together point out that it's important to pick the right polymer that meets all your objectives, but you can find a polymer that meets the objectives that has less potential to form NDMA. And the other important thing is to get the coagulation right to make sure that the, the, uh, pol the particles as well as the polymers are removed as well as possible. So that involves picking the right dose and optimizing your polymer. So this graph shows a typical jar test uh, graph. The, the uh, two vertical axes, axes are identical, just so you can see the, the data easier. The horizontal axis shows overflow rate increasing from right to left. The uh, facility that we were testing has an overflow rate at design of 0.25 GPM per square foot, which is about 10 minutes during a uh, jar test. Uh, this data shows that um, the no polymer, which is the one uh, farthest to the right and at the top, has no polymer. When you add increasing amounts of polymer, 0.6 and 0.7, the turbidity gets progressively better. Then 0.8, the turbidity is the best. So 0.8 is the optimal dose, and it does make a difference if you add more polymer uh, to, to that point. But if you add more than that, 0.9 and 1, the turbidity actually goes up. So you could say, well, the difference is not that great, so what's wrong with adding uh, a little more polymer? Well, for one, you're wasting polymer. Uh, two, you are getting a little less turbidity removal, and you know, in different waters, you, might, you want to repeat this test for your water to find out what your optimal condition is during this season, and your result in February might be different than your result in August. So in any way, if you get the optimal dose, you can get the turbidity removal that you want and you're adding the, the least amount of polymer you can to get the job done. Now, this example shows from uh, Project 4622 where you have no polymer and you coagulate it with, you know, whatever coagulant you're using. In this case, I believe it was a um, uh, PACL, uh, pH adjusted and all that. And the first bar is no polymer. Then you add the optimal dose of the polymer and you form a little bit more NDMA. But if you overdose and add twice as much polymer, you form even more NDMA.
So adding too much polymer can have an impact on your NDMA. In this graph, this shows combined results from three different studies. Uh, 4491, which is this project, 4452, uh, and then 4622. The vertical axis, again, is NDMA uh, formation. This is the ability of the uh, precursors that are present to react under standard conditions, either uniform field conditions or formation potential. Uh, you put the, the water that's there in contact with chloramine and see how many NDMA forms under those standard conditions. That's how you measure how much precursor is present under each of these conditions. The vertical axis, uh, the horizontal axis shows the different water systems. You can see that the blue bar is the optimal dose and the red bars are an overdose conducted with the same polymer at the same water system. Uh, what you'll see there in the first two bars from WRF4491, this is the same water system, B, but it's two different polymers. The first one is the plant polymer. The optimal dose is 0.4. The second one, the optimal dose is a different polymer, but the optimal dose is 0.2. You can see that the amount of um, NDMA formed is actually less than what would be formed with no polymer, which is the green dashed line. So overall, what you see in this graph is that a lot of times when you add the polymer, whether it's uh, optimal or overdose, you're going to form more NDMA than you would if you didn't have the polymer, although there are a few cases where it's showing that the polymer is able to remove some of the precursor material uh, from the watershed, and the net result is that the NDMA has actually gone down a little, even, even though you've added an NDMA precursor with your polymer. The other thing to notice is that when you overdose, you always have a lot more NDMA in your water that's formed. Um, one more thing to, before I leave this slide, you'll notice there's a few places where there's the same number listed. So there's eight is in the 4452 slides. It's also in the 4622 slides twice. The, in, the, um, the first, in, the, in, the, in the 4622, there's two different polymers. Uh, the, the shows the uh, optimal and overdose is 0.2 and 2 for the plant polymer and 0.2 and 2 for the alternate polymer. And you can see the differences in the NDMA formation at optimal conditions and at overdose depending on which polymer you use. So the overall um, thing I wanted to say from the polymer on these slides is that it's important which polymer you select that you get the one that does the particle removal that you want, but that also may, you may be able to get one that has a smaller um, NDMA uh, precursor added from that polymer. The other thing is once you pick a polymer, pick the right dose. If you overdose, you can create problems by adding more of that precursor material. So find the right polymer and add it at the right dose. The next thing we're going to talk about is free chlorine, HOCl. Uh, ammonia addition and chloramine addition uh, relative to where you add the polymer and where the clarification occurs. So if you have a situation without any polymer added and you add chlorine and then ammonia later versus adding the chloramine after the coagulation and after the, the clarification, the um, NDMA is higher uh, in the second case because um, the chlorine helps, does remove some of the watershed uh, precursor material when there's no uh, polymer present. The problem, of course, uh, your situation might be different and you can test this out for, for your water source, but in this water source, the reason they were using chloramines is because they have the great potential for DBP formation. And if you go pre-chlorination, you'll produce more than 200 micrograms per liter of both THM and HEA versus if you do chloramines afterwards, and after the, a lot of the precursor is removed, you can get it down to reduce it to less than two or less than 20. Um, if you do the same thing, but have a polymer present, you can see that the potential for formation is actually greater. Uh, it appears that the chlorine can break down part of the, uh, the uh, polymer precursor material so that it's more amenable to chloramination when the ammonia is added after clarification to form the chloramines, then it forms actually more NDMA with either the plant polymer 
or the, uh, a second polydadmac product, whereas the cornstarch, the bottom uh, for each of those three group, groups is uh, it's about the same. So we went from 114 going from chlorine first and then ammonia later to 17 when you add the ammonia after the precursor material has been removed. Uh, similarly, if you go chloramine before clarification while the chloramine is present in contact with the polymer versus after, you see that there is a greater potential for formation uh, when you have that whole polymer present acting uh, to react with the, with the precursor in the polymer. Talk a little bit about uh, powdered activated carbon. And in this test set of tests, we compare um, TOC and NDMA formation potential on the, uh, in this case, UFC, on the vertical axis. We have two sets of bars. The red bar is the NDMA. The blue is the TOC. The first two sets of bars to the left are with coagulant but no um, PAC. The next set is, says TACB, that means bituminous-based TAC. The next one is C for coconut-based. After that is L for lignite-based. And finally, the last two sets of bars are W for wood-based. And you can see if you compare the red bars for NDMA, the lignite, wood, and bituminous-based TACs were fairly similar for NDMA precursor removal. But... Um, for TOC, the bituminous was a little bit better. Now, technically, the wood one is slightly lower than the bituminous, but in this case, you might select the bituminous-based product, dosed in this case at 20 milligrams per liter PAC, this product more than the wood because you get, uh, in addition to the NDMA, you also get the unintended consequence of also reducing your TOC, and then hence your DVP, other DVP, formation of other DVPs. Now, your water source might be different, so you might want to test these different products to see maybe the wood-based product works, works best with the organic material and then the precursor material that's present in your source water. Um, but this shows what happened in this particular situation. Uh, before I leave, I wanted to talk a little bit about the consequences. Uh, you know, before we talked about what things you can do about picking the polymer, picking the right dose, picking where you add the chlorine, ammonia, polymer, et cetera. This is something you can't really do anything about when the bromide is in your water. But this um, I did want to mention what, you, what this means for you if you have to do a nitrosamine control strategy when you're in a water source that has more bromide or that in the future has a lot more bromide. In this case, this is a graph from Van Briesen. Um, if you look at the at the box and whisker closest to the vertical axis on the left, those are U.S. source waters. The uh, blue uh, box that goes across the graph is the range of bromide values that we tested in our project. So the point there is to show that the bromide levels that we're testing are not that far off the mark. They are consistent with um, the bromide levels that are can have been noted in U.S. surface waters, for example, the uh, graph later, we're going to talk about one that's 100 micrograms per liter or 0.1 milligrams per liter, which on this graph, you can see the box is at the top of the, the box, which means 25% of the U.S. source waters in this particular database had a bromide level of, high, of 100 micrograms per liter or higher. The bromide can come um, from coal-fired power plants, either from the coal itself or from bromide added to control um, aldecides or to control the discharges of air emissions from mercury, uh, NOx, etc. It could also come from fracking and, and from saline groundwater. Now, if you have a, a free chlorine, you can see a big impact in your THMs and HAAs as a result of having uh, forming brominated products instead of chlorinated projects. In this case, this is a water system that was uh, producing chloroform levels uh, you know, a, a less than 40 micrograms per liter prior to the installation of a wet scrubber at an upstream power plant. And you can see that most of the THM is chloroform, and there's a little bit of bromochlorothane, dichloromethane. But after the more bromide was in the water from the discharges, you can see that the, the chloroform levels drop. 
the total levels increase and the proportion from the bromide is much higher. Now, one, one solution you might have is to say, well, I'll, I'll add chloramines, or a lot of the system, uh, waters in this, using this source water might have already switched to chloramines. And um, in this case, you don't, might not think that bromide impacts nitrosamines because there are no bromine or chlorine in nitrosamines, but it can have an impact. And in particular, the synergistic effect of having the increased bromide and the presence of a polydadmac polymer. These two um, sets of bars show the NDMA formation potential on the left. Uh, shows one water, four sets of bars for one water system and four for another water system. The uh, one on the left shows that uh, it starts out without any polymer at 15. It increases by about 10 when you add polymer but don't add any bromide. It increases by about 30 when you add bromide but don't add any polymer. But if you take those two together, that would increase it by about 40, or it would be about 60 micrograms per, or nanograms per liter if you have both of them present, but it, it actually formed 80, so it formed 20 more than if you just had them individually present. So this shows the synergistic effect of having the, the polymer and uh, 100 micrograms per liter of bromide. The second set of bars for the PWSB water source shows it even more distinctly that Adding the polymer by itself or the bromide by itself didn't make much difference, but when they're both together, it more than doubled the NDMA formation. So if you're in a water uh, source that has some high bromide in it, you might have some NDMA problems uh, that you need to look into, and that can affect what polymer choices you, you make. Um, hopefully, Ashley is ready for her portion, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, the bed scale testing that she's done. Thank you. For utilities B and C that Carolyn talked about earlier with the source to cap monitoring and desktop studies, based upon those desktop studies, we identified some oxidation strategies that those two utilities might want to consider, and we did some bench scale testing to understand what those strategies might look like considering both NDMA reduction and simultaneous compliance. The objectives were to achieve simultaneous compliance, and specifically we were looking at bromate organics, so TOC and AOC, AOC being a similable organic carbon, that part of carbon that's very biodegradable and fuels distribution system regrowth, and precursors for THNs, HAAs, and NDMA. So we looked at water samples from both utilities B and C, and we started thinking about both raw and settled water, but then focused our testing just on settled water based upon the source to tap monitoring that showed that the primary source of precursors was from was polymer derived. So it was from the coagulation and sedimentation process. So what could we do downstream of that to help control NDMA precursors? We did sampling at two different events at each facility to look at seasonal differences and we started with some ozone bromate screening. So that's the first data that I'll show you. So looking at different ozone doses and contact times, how much bromate formed and selecting an appropriate operating strategy based upon that data. And then we transitioned into the actual ozonation or for utility C, both ozonation and chlorination testing and both of those testing of settled water samples. So just as a reminder, as I look at these graphs, I am going to show you data for trihalomethane, haloacetic acids, and NDMA. Those were measured after the uniform formation conditions test. So after the bench test, we reacted the samples for another three days with chloramines and then measured those different DBPs. So when I present those results, I'm going to talk about DBP precursors. Here's the first graph. So this is the first ozone, or ozone bromate screening test. This is an example for utility B where we were looking at settled water. It was collected in their April sampling event. Um, and the graph shows your bromate concentration at different contact times along the bottom. And the two different sets of bars represent different bromide conditions. So either bromide spiked to 100 micrograms per liter or under ambient bromide conditions. And then as a point of reference, the NCL is shown with the green line, and the different colors of the bars reflect different ozone to TOC ratios. Based upon those results, 
and looking at how much bromate, bromate formed in relation to the MCL, we selected the contact time of eight minutes with ambient bromide conditions for further testing at utility B. And that allowed us to look at how much NDMA reduction could we achieve without having to implement further bromate mitigation. So then under those testing conditions, we tested three different ozone conditions, no ozone, and then two different ozone to TOC ratios, and you see that reflected in the rows of the table shown. First of all, looking at TOC, trihalomethanes, and haloacetic acids, we didn't see a lot of difference with the different ozone to TOC ratios. So here I'm just showing the range. Um, there was a little bit of seasonal difference, so between the two different sampling events. And then if you look at the next column showing NDMA or NDMA precursors, we did see a pretty strong trend where as we added ozone, we saw decreases in NDMA precursors. For the April sampling event, at the ozone to TOC ratio of 0.5 to 1, we were able to achieve NDMA precursor concentrations below 10 nanograms per liter. The same was true of the 0.25 to 1 ozone to TOC ratio. We did not, however, get below 10 nanograms per liter with the August sampling event. So in that case, a higher ozone dose might be needed, which could then require some more bromate mitigation. For the April event, the NDMA reduction correlated to about a 50% NDMA precursor reduction. The August event was up to 39% reduction. So again, seeing that seasonal variation. We look at the next column, then you see those bromate concentrations. So at these lower ozone to TOC ratios, although there was a little bit of bromate formation, it was well below the MCL. But we do see a pretty big increase in AOC concentration. So those concentrations doubled or tripled as we increased the ozone to TOC ratio. Then for facility C, utility C, we looked at both chlorination and ozonation. So first to show you the results of the chlorination testing, we, chlorine was dosed at five milligrams per liter and three different contact times. So we started with a one minute contact time and that reflects their routine operational conditions. And then we tested a six and a 12 minute contact time. Those contact times were selected based upon an empirical model that Dr. Reckow established. He looked at a bunch of their historical water quality data and was able to establish a formula that helped to predict haloacetic acid and trihalomethane formation. And we were then able to select a free chlorine contact time that still allowed for meeting and, and having a buffer toward meeting the LRAA regulatory limits for those two regulated ZBPs. For the NDMA reduction in that second column, we again see as we increase free chlorine contact time, we do see a decrease in NDMA precursors. But both of them were still above at 10 nanograms per liter. So even at that maximum kind of predicted free chlorine contact time of 12 minutes, we were not able to achieve NDMA precursor levels below 10 nanograms per liter. The September event correlated with a percent reduction of up to about 52%, and the March event up to about 60%. Um, so again, a little bit of seasonal variation, not as much as utility B with the ozone testing. We then look at HAA concentrations. We see some slight increases, but, but very small, less than or equal to three micrograms per liter and some increases in THM formation as we increase the free chlorine contact time. The other strategy that was potentially identified for facility C was ozone oxidation. So we looked at ozone bench testing to determine if ozone would be a better fit for this specific utility. So here we're showing different ozone to TOC ratios um, similar testing conditions were selected for this facility, an eight-minute contact time, and ambient bromide concentrations, which for this facility were 67 and then 25 micrograms per liter. The different ozone to TOC ratios, we do see a decrease in NDMA precursors for the September event. At a 0.5 to 1 ozone to TOC ratio, we were able to achieve that 10 nanogram per liter NDMA precursor concentration that correlated with up to a 67% reduction in NDMA precursors. In March, we had to bump that up to a 1.0 to 1 ozone to TOC ratio, 
but we were then able to see NDMA reduction of up to 95%, reducing the NDMA precursors to below detectable levels. Looking at following the same rows and looking at bromate formation under those conditions that achieved the low NDMA precursors, although there was some increases in bromate for those two conditions in September, the 0.5 to 1, and March, the 1 to 1 ozone to TOC ratios, bromate formation was still well below the MCL. However, AOC still did increase, um, in this case, in both events, it about doubled, um, and that definitely is something that still would require mitigation. So overall, you know, looking at these two utilities and the spinach testing as two different case studies, it does look like oxidation, specifically in this case, settled water oxidation downstream of coagulation sedimentation could be a very effective strategy for them. It, and this data shows that they, under the right operational conditions, can achieve a simultaneous compliance, but they would need to, under some conditions, potentially mitigate bromate and they would need to control AOC. One of the common methods for controlling AOC is coupling ozonation with biofiltration. You look at this next table, we you know, looked into literature. There hasn't been a lot of study of the impact of NDMA formation across biofiltration, but some studies have a monitored NDMA precursor concentrations in the biofilter influent and effluent. In this table, we have different plant numbers and sampling dates, and then the green numbers represent a positive change in NDMA formation, and the red numbers represent a negative change in NDMA formation. What stands out is that there's a pretty good mixture of both positive and negative changes, and it leads to the question of why is that happening. Further, if you look at a specific plant, like for example, plant 16 that's in that black box, we see that for one sampling event, there was no change, then we had some negative changes and then a positive change. So what's different between those different sampling events that's causing biofiltration to switch from a control strategy in one event to a source of precursors in the next event? And to investigate that, we, as we were wrapping up Project 4491, Arcadis also started Project 4669. That project is specifically looking at links between biofiltration and a bunch of different factors that could explain those differences between the different plants and different sampling events. So we're considering factors like microorganisms, or there's certain microorganisms like ammonia oxidizing archaea or bacteria that are triggering formation of, of NDMA precursors across biofiltration. Is it something the biofilms themselves are shedding? What about organic and inorganic precursors? Are biofilters somehow transforming wastewater, effluent, or cationic polymers, ammonia, or chloramines into more potent precursors or, or triggering reactions within the biofilters? We also thought about upstream treatment processes. Is our upstream treatment processes conditioning the biofilter influent in a way that's more or less conducive to forming precursors across biofiltration? And what about operational conditions? What about media age and type or backwashing protocols? Could, could runtime or your backwashing frequency affect how many precursors you see generated across biofilters? I'm not going to go into what all the results are of that project today to keep us focused on 4491, but this is coming soon. We're wrapping up the final report right now, and we'll be working with the Water Research Foundation to schedule a webcast for that potentially later this year. So stay tuned for that if you're interested in learning which of those factors we proved true and which ones we disproved. Um, I also just wanted to mention that we will be talking about this and other emerging containments at the AWWA Biological Treatment Symposium, which is scheduled for February in Atlanta. With that, I'm going to pass it back over to Carolyn, and she's going to wrap up with a few cost considerations and conclusions. Thanks, Ashley. So um, there was an earlier AWWA WETAF project that started to capture some costs associated with implementing nitrosamine control strategies, but um, it was more of a desktop assessment. And what we found was we really needed to get the quantitative data from the bench testing that Ashley and Richard presented to begin to develop design criteria and actually establish vendor um, supplied costs to implement specific control strategies 
for um, water utilities to reduce NDMA concentrations to meet specific uh, treatment targets. So what this table shows is um, for utility B, what control strategies and specific design criteria would need to be um, implemented to, to meet the, a 30 nanogram per liter tr treatment target, a 20 nanogram per liter treatment target, or 10 nanogram per liter treatment target. And the final report shows the same sort of information for utility C. Um, for utility B, the concentrations were below 30 nanogram per liter, so the assumption was no treatment would be needed. For 20 nanogram per liter, based on the bench testing that Ashley presented, um, ozonation, settled water ozonation at a 0.5 to 1 ozone to TOC ratio um, could reduce NDMA concentrations uh, to meet that target. Um, we did find that you would probably need uh, conversion to biofiltration to mitigate AOC in conjunction with ozone addition. Some of uh, Richard's bench tests on pack addition illustrated that um, a pack, uh, increasing the pack dose at that utility could also be used to meet a 20 nanogram per liter target. And the only thing, other, other thing I'll point out from this table is, is you try to meet a more stringent target of 10 nanogram per liter for settled water ozonation that would require a higher ozone to TOC ratio and based on the bench test, um, cost to mitigate bromate would also need to be considered and were, incur and, and were considered in the cost opinions. So the report walks through the approach for developing conceptual level costs for the two utilities. Um, I'm just going to focus on, on the trends in the interest of time. This slide shows um, in the top graph the total net present value um, to uh, upgrade the PAC system at utility B to meet the respective NDMA treatment goals. And in the bottom graph, the total net present value to implement ozone and corresponding AOC and bromate mitigation strategies to meet the respective NDMA treatment goals. And the main thing to highlight from this cost assessment is that the costs depend on the regulatory level, which makes sense. Um, at a lower, at a less stringent NDMA treatment goal, some plants may be able to make small tweaks at low cost to meet that goal. Um, the costs will also vary depending on the compliance options that can be feasibly implemented to meet targets. If utility B is able to meet the goals with uh, upgrades to the PAC system, it's estimated to be lower cost than if they needed to implement ozone. And the other thing we found for the cost evaluation for both utilities was that the cost to mitigate unintended consequences um, can add significantly to the cost of installing treatment to reduce NDMA concentrations and need to be considered in any federal um, regulatory evaluation of uh, the treatment and cost implications of an NDMA uh, standard and also for a utility to understand the cost to implement an NDMA uh, treatment strategy. So in conclusions, we went through a lot of data um, and we're looking forward to answering some of the questions that came in. I want to summarize some of the key points specifically to the Water Research Foundation Project 4491. Um, the report tabulates simultaneous compliance, risk balancing, and operational consequences of implementing nitrosamine control strategies, and that's the intention is to have that information all in one spot. Um, the project highlighted that UCMR2 data alone are insufficient to assess NDMA sources, um, so profiling is needed to identify the sources. Seasonal bench testing is also needed to assess the impact of potential control strategies on performance targets and consequences. And the optimal control strategy is going to depend on a lot of factors. Um, the source water characteristics, the, the treatment characteristics, target NDMA concentration, and then simultaneous, simultaneous compliance and operational factors and costs. Um, the costs vary depending on treatment target and compliance options that can be feasibly implemented, and the cost to mitigate unintended consequences need to be considered. Um, so as we move into the question and answer session, I'm just going to leave this slide up here just as a teaser for the type of information that's um, developed and included in the final project report for this project. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Ashley. That is a lot of information. Okay, so now we have a few minutes for questions, and I hopefully, hopefully I don't get the technical 
issues I had at the beginning. Uh, we have a lot of questions, and I'm going to pick some uh, just uh, to get started. And the one that have not been answered now, we will answer them later. And then keep in mind that the whole webcast uh, is recorded, and you can download it within 24 hours. Uh, let me pick uh, one question that I thought was kind of interesting. It's just me deciding. Why is the team using 10 nanograms per liter as a goal of a goal point for NDMA? Why 10 nanograms per liter? Uh, I think Caroline, uh, you can answer that. Um, sure. So I I think the 10 nanogram per liter level is it's really derived from the California notification level in the absence of any um, federal uh, guidelines. It's used as a placeholder on, on maybe the more stringent level that EPA may consider uh, regulating um, NDMA at. Um, but to kind of share the full range, if you looked at the 10 to the minus 6 health risk level from one of the earlier slides, 0.7 nanogram per liter associated with a 10 to the minus 6 health risk level. Um, but the MRL is at 2 nanogram per liter, so we can't quantify reliably below 2 nanogram per liter. 70 nanogram per liter would be 10 to the minus fourth health risk level, which would be synonymous with the approach to bromate for bromate. Those can kind of be bookends for where the range of where um, EPA could consider regulating. Okay, thank you, Karen. Uh, another general question that I think maybe some of the audience would be interested. The question, what is UFC uniform formation condition? And I assume the question, what is UFC versus SDS versus SP? Uh, any of you can pick up this question. I think there would be an interest. Just general, what's the difference between UFC and SP and uh, uh, all the tests? for formation of uh, DVP. This Nobody is Carolyn, I can I'm start and assign it to Caroline again. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and Ashley and Richard, feel free to chime in. But um, uniform formation conditions are done, are, um, it was actually a, initiated as a procedure for trihalomethanes. I think I saw Phil Singer is one of the participants on this call, and he authored it. Um, Actually, it's uh, Scott Summers who authored a paper on, on uniform formation conditions for trihalomethanes and the halocytic acids. And the whole point was to try to establish a uniform approach to looking at DBP formation um, at levels that are more relevant to what where utilities typically um, a, a disinfect. So um, in contrast, formation potential, you add a lot of chloramines and you react for a long time and you basically try to react all the precursors that are reactable in a sample. Um, simulated distribution system conditions are yet another approach where you uh, chloraminate under site-specific conditions to so hold at the pH at the temperature and the whole time that's relevant to a, a specific utility um, uh, utilities characteristics. But UFC, to get into the details, are what we did for our project, we're chloraminating to achieve a 2.5 milligram per liter chloramine residual after three minutes, buffer to pH 8, um, hold for uh, three days, and we used preformed chloramines at a 4.75 to 1 chlorine to ammonia nitrogen mass ratio. Thank you. Ashley, Richard, anything to add to that? I think that was very comprehensive. Um, okay, I'm going to ask a question. I think this question will go to uh, Richard. Uh, did you do any screening to separate any monomers uh, from the polymer prior to feeding uh, to the feeding to the plant? And that's the objective was to lessen NDMA formation. So, did you do any screening to remove um, monomers? Um, you know, the, the products that we used were, um, you know, commercially available. These were the polymers that the plant was using at the time. We didn't do any processing of those uh, polymers to remove the monomers or even to quantify them. That was a topic of the 4622 um, rest of the project. I, I included parts from the jar test, but there are different aspects of 4622, and that is one that went 
goes into in great detail in uh, Dr. Westerhoff's uh, report that will be coming out uh, that talks about the screening and how you can uh, improve the uh, uh, reduce the NDMA formation by getting rid of the lower molecular weight materials. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, well, uh, that's a question, and uh, I'm just, why did you measure HAA9 only uh, when we know that uh, only, uh, we only have five HAA regulated at this time? I think uh, I'll let anybody pick up this. Why do we care about the HA9 when they are not regulated? Maybe you want to answer that one, Jeanette. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just the facilitator. <laughs> it, it shows the impact of the brominated species. So the HA5 only has two brominated species, but there are six others that have bromide um, in them, bromine in them, excuse me. And so that some people look at the what's called HEA6, which is all the HEA9s minus the three that only have chlorine in them. But it's basically to get an idea of more of, of the HEA, uh, the bromide substituted HEAs. Yeah, we're trying to be uh, proactive because eventually they may be regulated since the brominated species are the more toxic, actually. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? <laughs> okay, I think that's a question that Ashley or Caroline can uh, can uh, answer. Uh, I have seen presentation on potable reuse treatment indicating that biofiltration uh, help remove NDMA. How is that different from the data you showed? Uh, when I'm indicating, it's a long question, indicating various performance of biological situation on NDMA formation. So, um, Ashley or Caroline, can you answer this question? Yeah, I can, I can take that, Jeanette. This is Ashley. So, it, in that particular reuse application, I've most commonly seen it removal of, of actual NDMA as opposed to NDMA precursors. What we're seeing in the drinking water applications is generally the, the NDMA, or sometimes we call it preformed NDMA to specify. When you measure without doing any chloramination, that NDMA concentration is generally non-detect in drinking water systems are very close to the detection limit of going across biofilters. But NDMA precursors, so concentrations that appear when you react to them with chloramines are changing across the drinking water biofilters. So it's that difference between the actual NDMA that's already formed and the amount of NDMA that will form in a distribution system. Okay, great. Um, that's a question to uh, Richard, I think. Uh, does it make a difference if you feed uh, Neat or, dis or diluted polymer with respect to NDMA. Is there a difference when you the neat or the or the diluted polymer? I suppose diluted in water. <laughs> Richard, um, normally, um, normally we like to to suggest that people do the diluted first so that the polymer has a chance to unwind, um, if you will, uh, in the in the aging tank before you you add it. If you add it neat uh, with respect to NDMA, we talked about if you overdose or add too much polymer, you're adding that much more precursor than you need to get the job done, which is remove the particles. So if you dilute and, and feed it with an aging tank, um, there is the possibility that you can get the same effective particle removal at a lower polymer dose so you can add uh, less polymer, whereas if you add it neat, you might have to add more polymer to see the same effect just because the polymer isn't working as efficiently if it's, fe if it's fed neat. Makes sense. Um, I'm going to go back to Caroline. Uh, how, do you how do you pick up sampling location for the source to, ta to tap profiling? Um, that's a really good question. So. The, um, the short answer is really to kind of look at the uh, treatment plant and identify potential sort 
just based on what we know about NDMA, what the sources might be, and make sure you pick sampling sites that will quantify the relative importance of those sources. And the, um, I guess the follow-up to that is for the project report, we developed guidelines on source-to-tap sampling, and it really walks through in greater detail how um, a utility would pick those sampling locations and additionally, what additional um, water quality parameters the utility would want to analyze for the same time to characterize uh, seasonal variability in, in source water um, characteristics and also um, data you would want to capture on plant operations. Um, I guess one other thing to note on that is, for example, for a utility that has two, two or more sources, um, the source water sampling would, in, would, would should capture both of all of those sources. So those details are in the guidelines in the project report. Thank you. Well, we have a lot of questions. So um, again, I'm going to let you decide. Uh, the question was, does uh, potassium permanganate affect NDMA precursors? Any guess? Um, we have not tested that, but my guess it would be similar to the um, uh, DBP precursors, THM and HA precursors, that it would not be uh, very effective uh, other than it would allow you to delay your point of, of chlorination. Okay, thank you. I think the question, this question has been already answered. What protocol? Did you use for NDMA USC? I think we covered that. Um, trying, yeah, I'm trying to get questions that. Uh, uh, so, Richard, this is a question for you. Are the vegetable-based polymer uh, they are are they NSF certified? Um, to my knowledge, the, and when, at the time we tested them, they were not, and to my knowledge, they have not been. Um, they were and still are FDA approved, but they just haven't gone through the process of, you know, paying the fee and doing the testing um, for use at drinking water plants. Uh, so there is little doubt that they would easily pass uh, the NSF 60 certification, but to my knowledge, they're not currently um, uh, certified for NSF, but again, if, if you wanted to get them, you could, the man, when, as long as the manufacturer does get them certified, they should be um, uh, certified for use in drinking water. Thank you. Um, let me see. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, that was the question, and then again, I'm going to pick up to. Uh, <laughs> Richard, I don't know if you can answer that. Uh, the, the, I mean, the, the suggestion: Why could you leave, could you list the polymers used? Um, we purposely did not because uh, we wanted to uh, for confidentiality. Uh, we did um, that we didn't list the um, drinking water utilities themselves or the polymers used, other than they characterized them. Some of them um, in the report they are described as. Um, uh, what, you know, what percent active they are and whether they're low molecular weight or high molecular weight or high charge or low charge, uh, but we didn't identify the exact name of the product. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, very correct and very cautious. Um, the next question, and I think Paul was to have, if he were in these things, would love to answer, uh, is that what fraction of watershed precursors are natural DOC versus anthropogenic? We don't know what fraction. So uh, I'm not sure actually if I understand. Does anybody have an idea about that? Um, which ones are natural versus the ones that are um, of anthropogenic origin? This is Carol, and I don't have a great answer to that. So maybe Richard, if you have anything to add on, you can. But I, I would just say direct you to some of the um, publications on the topic that may provide some um, some guidance 
I know that uh, Richard Valentine published an, a paper indicating some sources of natural, um, uh, naturally occurring uh, NDMA precursors. A lot of work has been done um, talking about the different anthropogenic sources, um, including uh, diuran, which is a, a herbicide, ranitidine, which is a pharmaceutical and wastewater um, derived uh, um, uh, effluent organic matter. Um, but to the extent of that one is more important than the other in a greater fraction, um, there was a paper, there was a Water Research Foundation project conducted by, um, by Eric Dickinson that looked at the sources. Um, mm -hmm. It's worth checking out, and um, like you mentioned, Jeanette, uh, looking at some of the papers from Paul Westerhaus' group, fractionating the organic compounds. But I, I, I think to end my long-winded answer and rambling answer, uh, I would uh, uh, guess that it depends quite a bit on the specific source. Okay, thank you. I would really encourage you to look at Project 4499, which is the relative importance, I'm trying to remember the title exactly, relative importance of uh, anthropogenic and natural things, and uh, Paul Westerhoff has done a great job uh, with his student, David Hannigan, and they identified some precursors like methadon. And, uh, so I think there is a lot. Susan Andrews in Ottawa also, in Toronto, has done great work on that. There is a lot. So, um, But uh, we'll probably maybe get more information and then we'll add that to the to the answers, uh, but I think that's a good question. Again, 4499 is a great project to look at. Uh, it's on our website. So uh, this question goes to Richard uh, because he talked about the natural polymer. <laughs> uh, what are the disadvantages of the natural polymer since they do not contribute to NDMA formation? Um, well, the, the disadvantages are one of them we talked about before. They're not currently NSF certified, so you can't use them in drinking water, but they would be if the manufacturers would go through the process of getting them certified, and they would certainly work uh, well uh, for the particle removal. Um, the cost, we're not sure of because, again, for the same reason, they haven't gone through the process of preparing them for commercial you know, products, but to um, our understanding, uh, is that they they appear that they will be about the same price as the currently used uh, polymers. Um, there is uh, the potential, especially for the chitosan, for example, which uses uh, an acid. If you use an acetic acid, the acetic acid can promote some biological activity, which you might not want in the filter, but you can overcome that by either chlorinating or before the before the filter or switching to a hydrochloric acid instead. Um, but the, that would be the biggest ones is, the, is probably the potential for the cost and it, and it hasn't been used a lot for other drinking water facilities and most drinking water facilities like to see it used somewhere else before they try it. Thank you, Richard. Thanks again for Ashley and all the team. As you say, we have a lot of uh, people who were not present today, but they have participated in this project, like Stu Krasner, David Conwell, Paul Westerhoff. I mean, we have several researchers. Uh, so I think uh, we have reached our 90-minute uh, uh, deadline time. So uh, again, uh, before I leave, I want to thank you all for staying with us for this 90 minutes. Don't forget to uh, to fill the survey. Uh, we really need your input for that. Uh, if you have any question, um, I'm sorry. Oops, technical difficulties again. Please contact me, Janet Kiari, Dick Kiari at Water Research Foundation. Uh, for the the PDH, you can contact Michelle Chiazo, and please look at our website, and all the information is there. And uh, Within uh, 24 hours, you can download and uh, the recording and the presentation for this webcast. Looking forward to see you in the next webcast. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon.
Okay, great.